Yes, Smita. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, on a very interesting topic of the transgender's law on POSH and other related laws. Myself, Madhura from Indian Lawyers Association. Uh, before we start, just a bit about what we do. So we are the largest organization of Indian lawyers um, present in about 75 cities so far. And we undertake various initiatives and activities uh, that can create a platform for lawyers, uh, Indian lawyers based in India as well as uh, wherever in the globe. We run uh, several initiatives undertaken by different committees that we have. Uh, tomorrow sometime during the day, I'll be very happy to share a brief about us to all of you over email. So now I hand it, I hand it over to Smita, the moderator for the day. Smita, over to you. Thank you, Madhura, and good evening, everybody. We have around 38 participants. That's a big number considering it is an evening on Thursday. That means this subject is really interesting. And trust me, uh, this has been quite an intriguing su subject for me too. Uh, so welcome on board. My name is Smita Kapoor. I am the CEO and co-founder at Kelp HR. Uh, ILA and Kelp HR have started this series of learning, okay? Uh, basically giving back to the society on varied subjects under Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act 2013. And one very important law which got passed in 2019 is about Transgenders Act, right? So we thought this act must be impacting the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act of 2013 and how does it impact us? So we have got some really eminent people on board who will be discussing about it. And I'll be picking their brains to see. And please be open, please ask questions because your questions will add value to this discussion today, right? So what I know about uh, transgenders uh, uh, is something that I would want to start with. But before that, I would want to introduce you to the panel members. I have with me, Vaishali Bhagwat, she's a practicing lawyer and a chivening scholar, okay? This is something that I got to know when I spoke to Vaishali, okay? This is something that very accomplished people do. They become scholars after researching a lot of work is what I understand, Vaishali. I'll leave it to you because I don't think I'll do justice to your introduction. That is about Vaishali. We have a lovely Sumedha Giridharan. She is a senior associate with IC Universal Legal. Um, she is based out of Chennai. Um, uh, she does a lot of things which I read in her resume, but I'll leave it to her to describe it. Another amazing lady that we have here on this panel is Amulya Narayan. Uh, she's a law lawyer and a theater artist. I really don't know how she mixes the two things together, but it is amazing when you speak to Amulya, you'll know more about it. Yeah. So moving on, uh, to what I understand about transgender, right? Uh, the definition is this, right? Uh, denoting or relating to a person whose sense of uh, personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth sex. So that is what is the definition even in the act which was passed on um, two in 2019, the Transgender Persons Protection of Right Act in 2019. So I was doing a little bit of research about third gender, right? And me being brought up in uh, Mumbai in a society where transgenders were not treated so well, okay? So I was trying to figure out what mm -hmm. does our history con consist of. Mm -hmm. And then when I went back to Hindu mythology, I'm a big fan of mythology and our history. I realized that it was a strong presence, okay? Uh, very, uh, so if you look at Mahabharata, if you look at Ramayana, there is a strong mention of transgender's role in our society, but it got criminalized when Britishers came over. So the West, when they came here, it got criminalized and we started looking at it differently. So this is something which changed because of the Western impact on India is what I did. So now, thankfully, the 2019 Act has come up and we have to um, understand how do we incorporate this whole aspect into our corporate world. And that's the idea of getting these 
eminent people to come and speak to us. So uh, I'm going to stop share here and open up this dialogue. I come to Vaishali first, you, if you could uh, give me a short introduction about yourself and a little bit of summary about the Just one small request to others, please put yourself on mute. So first, thank you, Smita, Kelpechar, and ILA for, first, let me congratulate, in fact, Kelpechar and ILA for taking up this subject for discussion, something that all of us sort of stay away from. And this subject has not been part of a, a central narrative uh, to a lot of us people, unless and until, say, as professionals, we come across with a case or we need to deal with a real life situation, but we've not really gone out of our way to understand what these tricky issues can be. So I really want to congratulate both the organizations for um, having a, a dialogue and a conversation around this topic with professionals also present in the audience. I also thank both of you, Smita, ILA representatives and Kelpechar office bearers for giving me this opportunity to speak on this subject. It also give, gave me a chance to read a little more about what it really means and what it, it the way it is going to impact not only us as professionals, but also us as human beings. A little bit about myself. Uh, you can read more about me at www.shalibhagbar.com. But just, you know, just to put it in context as to why I have been invited here is I've been a practicing lawyer for the past 22, 23 years now. Um, my specialization is information technology law because I had a previous qualification and work experience in core IT and assembly language programming. But I also, you know, sometimes it naturally happens being a woman or a lady lawyer, you tend to gravitate towards problems relay which are gender based, uh, violence which is gender based. And I have gone, got drawn to issues relating to women and children when it comes to uh, violence that impacts them. And that is why perhaps the subject too uh, is uh, sort of close to my heart. I've been in, uh, in the civil litigation uh, uh, and non-litigation practice, as I said, for several years. And uh, I run a 50-year-old law firm in Pune. Uh, now, uh, let's come directly to the subject. And uh, as Smita has asked me to give uh, the opening remarks so, so that we can put this entire subject in context and it'll, I'm sure it will open up in a way a can of worms and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions to, to ask all the panelists after this. So I wanted to make say four points to begin with uh, as to how is this law relating to transgenders uh, is shaping up uh, from where have we started and where we, we ought to go is how I would like to put it. And for that I'm going to refer obviously to two judgments of the Supreme Court, one which was passed in the year 2014, that was the NALSA judgment, which has been a very path breaking judgment. You know, the way for Posh, we keep referring to Vishaka judgment, we say that is where it started. And that is where the Supreme Court intervened and said women need to have special protection against different forms of violence, including sexual violence. That is what NALSA judgment has done to transgenders. Because transgenders, uh, grievances were completely unaddressed as if they did not exist as human beings on the face of earth. And that is where the Supreme Court intervened and said that transgenders need to have a, a right of self-declaration. It is their own right to make a choice as to what gender they, they are aligning themselves to. Uh, does, does a transgender feel he is a man? Does she feel he's a, she's a woman? Or then does she feel or he or she feels that they are a third gender and that self declaration or self determination right was uh, conferred or sort of upheld. I won't say conferred, but it was, uh, it was upheld. It's an intrinsic right available as a human right to be recognized uh, by a gender that you identify with and that was recognized by the Supreme Court in 2017. The second judgment we most of us are aware of is relating to section 377 and its constitutionality, which was given by the Supreme Court uh, in 2018. Uh, that also uh, sp uh, spoke very widely about third genders, 
and uh, their inalienable right uh, of being treated as a human being and all their constitutional rights having been protected um, irrespective of what their gender is so th these two judgments sort of uh, set the tone of how laws uh, relating to transgenders should be shaped and one of the underlying fundamental narrative of both these judgments is self declaration i keep coming back to it because unfortunately um, when the transgender protection act got enacted in 2019 it sort of diluted what the supreme court judgments have said by saying that transgenders need to apply for a certificate of of a gender before the magistrate so somehow a sort of a self uh, determination self declaration right which was available to them by a supreme supreme court dictat was somewhere uh, if i can say diluted i i won't say taken away but diluted uh, when the transgenders act was enacted in 2019 again uh, uh, just another point that i would i would like to make because even all of us sort of struggle with what is the real definition of a transgender and please permit me because i'm going to read that section out because that will that will actually i don't want to miss out on any word because every word in that in that definition is really important i'm reading out from the transgender persons protection of rights act 2019 i'm reading out from section 2 subsection i i'm assuming most of the the audience members will be they are going to be lawyers so i'm going to be a little lawyer like so so the subject goes goes down very well at the end of the discussion so to to i says person with intersex variations means a person who at birth shows variation in his or her primary sexual characteristics external genitalia chromosomes or hormones from normative standards of male or female body that's a very specific de description of an intersex variation or a person having intersex variation which is included in the definition of a transgender transgender means a person whose gender does not match with the gender assigned to that person at birth and includes trans man trans woman whether or not such person has undergone sex reassignment surgery or hormone therapy or laser therapy or any other therapy person with intersex variations gender queer and person having socio cultural identity such as kinnar hijda arwani and jyotta very well worded definitions it does not leave anything to imagination it's very scientifically worded definitions and this law now gives right to such people or transgender people to yes self determine self declare but then validate that self declaration of being a transgender by applying for a certificate before the magistrate one more point which is very important to be noted in the legislation is it talks of prevention of all forms of discrimination um, uh, against the transgenders and provides for for it, it it defines a criminal offense of sexual harassment punishable with 2 years of imprisonment if any transgender is subjected to sexual harassment so criminal uh, offense is definitely uh, defined under the act however uh, the way the posh act does there is no internal redressal mechanism described here however the act also talks of appointment of a complaints officer for redressal of any grievance uh, that is suffered by a transgender and the last point would be what does the human rights act uh, talk about which was enacted in 1993 talks about uh, whether transgenders will be protected under human rights uh, act and whether human rights commissions uh we'll have certain powers to look into it but i think in the course of discussion we can take that up thank you smita thank you vaishali that was quite a comprehensive uh, summary of the act thank you very much for that and quite an exhaustive definition actually okay so uh, moving to sumedha sumedha your opening remarks on uh, this act uh, what do you think about it yeah I I just um, I'm just briefly going to introduce myself. I'm Sumedha from uh, IC. I'm a senior associate at IC University Legal. 
Our primary area includes transaction law and a major chunk of our uh, uh, work that we do also includes employment disputes and compliance with uh, various labor laws. Um, having said that, so uh, I will just try straight away dive into the topic. Um, transgender law, I think the 2019 Act is one of the um, most important uh, legislations, I would say, considering the current scenario in, the, um, uh, in our country. So um, while transgender, so the transgender law lays down various provisions under which uh, what all can be done, what needs to be in the compliance um, and everything um, around how compliance can be ensured by every establishment and what the government. So the major important point that we need to notice is the fact that how the central government has powers to actually uh, provide uh, guide, guidance, instructions, and mandate establishments to follow various things. While the, so there is one major aspect that transgenders primarily face is the fact that they are um, most of the time discriminated from the general uh, people and their lack of so, uh, soft skills, which actually causes them to not have any employment or how they can progress in life. So the, this act actually structures down what can be adopted, what is the way, how the government functions, and in detail lays down how the um, way forward for a country like India. Having said that, I think, sorry, yes, please. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so having said that, I think the this is a step, this is the first step, and there's a way forward that the country is looking towards. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, that that lays the foundation of our discussion today, and we will be discussing more about it, Sumedha. So moving to Amulya. Amulya, I would want you to introduce yourself and uh, uh, give us a short summary of what is your take on the act. Thank you, Smita. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Amulya. I'm a, I'm a graduate of uh, LUJS Kolkata. I graduated in 2011 and I practiced for about uh, six years in the corporate uh, field. And after that, I decided to, to you know, change careers. I uh, took up theater, which I'd always been passionate about. And uh, somehow through some theater-based training programs, I found my way to Kelp HR, where I now also uh, work in the HR uh, side of things. So it's very interesting for me to look at uh, the Transgender Act now with, uh, you know, with respect to uh, employment and establishment, because first I was on the legal side, and now you can say, you can say that I'm kind of more on the HR side of things. So uh, having looked at the letter of the law, having seen uh, what it mandates, what it gets right, what it gets not so right, I also believe there is a lot uh, you know, to be done on the implementation side. And uh, while the... Uh, while the while the uh, act does get many things right in terms of you know penalizing vi violence against transgender persons and also in making the definition of transgender as comprehensive as possible there are uh, many objections that have been also you know raised by some members of the transgender community to what uh, in 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 respect of the things that can be better defined or better laid out and and as shali ma'am already pointed out in the certificate of identity which is granted by an authority is is perhaps not a step in the right direction uh, because uh, uh, as the nalsa judgment said they should have the right to self determine determination and it, it they should not wait for their identity to be affirmed by you know a, a certificate that is granted by the state so uh, having said that uh, i i uh, and as, as sumeda also mentioned i think this is a step in the right direction and uh, we have to make sure that uh, you know the uh, that a lot of the other interest groups and stakeholders such as employers and uh, of various kinds of establishments and organizations should come together and uphold this as well there is a lot to be done in on, in terms of the society also you know accepting uh, transgender persons in a in a in a comprehensive way and uh, hopefully this law will show us the way thank you amulya uh, now that uh, we have uh, an input from you about what works well, what doesn't work well. So my next question, I'm posing it to you and uh, Vaishali and uh, Sumedha can chip in. What, because we work in the space of prevention of sexual harassment, 
okay uh, my question is that what are those laws all right which get impacted because of this 2019 act okay for transgenders are there any corporate policies which needs to be relooked at okay and what is your take on that do you want me to go first or yes please please I'll I'll open for me yes uh, all right so um i don't think there is any direct impact of the transgender legislation on any other legislation because it it just enhances the uh the sections or the penal provisions which are already existing in fact we all know that the existing penal provisions are because they are gender specific and not gender neutral the only uh legislation which is gender neutral when it comes to sexual violence is the protection of children from sexual offences act that is the poxo and so that is that is a very wholesome uh legislation which looks at all forms of uh, violence and sexual harassment when it involves children which means that a uh, transgender child any person below the age of 18 if if he sexual he she or they are sexually harassed so irrespective of their gender they will get covered under poxo so we did not require a transgender specific legislation when it came to people below the age of 18 so i think that that puts a lot of things in context now we need to deal with others who are above 18 uh there uh, i would like to refer to another uh, a case which was before the delhi high court and the delhi high court said that uh 354a or 350 50 whatever is the section for sexual harassment 354a will also now can be applied to uh sexual harassment of transgenders in fact there was a petition before the delhi high court pending because the delhi police had uh, expressed their inability to take up visions of the case and before the high court the delhi police on their own so motor said that we are registering the case below that particular section and that is why the petition got dismissed so uh we can see that the the mindsets are changing mindsets of legislators are changing the mindsets of implementing authorities uh, or, or uh, the police machinery is changing where the approach is now more inclusive uh, so so in, again just to coming back to your question a direct impact is not there in fact it it reads into and it it enlarges the scope of existing legislations because now we have a very specific act and before that supreme court very specifically describing what the third gender is where there was so much confusion around third genders including fluidity of genders uh to answer the second part of your question relating to policies and what, what are establishments doing or should be doing uh let me try and answer this in two ways let's say uh, let's let's assume this act does not exist but i think as a uh as any organization promoting inclusivity and diversity uh proactive steps should be taken by all organizations to recognize humans as human beings and not put a gender label on it uh, organizations also need to to look at human beings are uh, and not bucket them in terms of sexual preference who are you in fact the, who who do you want to have sex with should not define you as a person and that is a very broad way in which i think organizations need to look at now the moment you have a top management buy in to a uh, to an environment which is all inclusive it percolates down we all we all have worked in corporate environment so we know that unless and until the top person doesn't believe in this it's not going to percolate down so it's very very important that the top management is sensitized about this um uh, then it comes to awareness and discussion and having dialogues around this subject and we all know uh, we all behave properly when there is a law or there is a policy so uh, and, uh, having a discussion is something else but having a diktat is something else so organizational policies need to have need to address this head on describe it properly and as i said irrespective of whether the law existed or not 
now coming back to now there is a law which actually says establishment shall not discriminate against transgenders and if they do discriminate there is a liability because there is a violation of law so now there is something uh, that is now mandated and how will a corporate body ensure compliance by having a process in place and by having a policy in place so i think a short answer now how the policy all of that maybe uh, in, in in at some later point after amulya and sumeda sure so amulya sumeda what's your take on this yeah thank you vishali ma'am uh, so uh, i from my time uh, working with kelpechar and uh, so you know reading a little bit about the transgender act uh, so off the top of 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 the bat it would be important for uh, companies to revise and update their hiring policies i believe because if you look around you if you look at the places that you work at you rarely see any any uh, out trans person you 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 would not have noticed um, i mean you mostly would would know your colleagues as, as men or women and this is because uh, one thing is of course they are uh, they are discriminated against since their childhood so they do not even receive skill, skilling and training and a proper education but also because uh, uh, because of the criminal uh, uh, nature of the law associated with them many organizations do not employ transgender people but uh, hopefully uh, because of the act now there will be positive discrimination you know towards transgender people in, in terms of maybe creating some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, some maybe a small quota towards hiring them saying that some percentage of our uh, of our uh, workforce will will be from the lgbt community you know those are some steps that they could take and another uh, very important policy i would say is the anti discrimination policy uh, this is something Uh, which would be required because there is there are a lot of conversations that take place on you know office floors there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, soft discrimination that happens even if it is not you know, something that uh, that that may be reflected in the promotion or the hiring it it can take it can uh, affect uh, someone's psyche in the everyday behavior that they face in the everyday kind of uh, you know discrimination that they may face and uh, this kind of disc- anti discrimination policy could specifically say that you know any transgender person should always be referred to by their preferred pronouns for example so uh, if if they if they have been assigned the female gender but they identify as male then they should be referred to as he uh, or if they identify as trans then they should be referred to as they and these are small these may be small things for us but they are very important in uh, in terms of the in terms of the idea of self determination and they should not be denied this because this is something that will go a long way into affecting their sense of self and of course their productivity at work as well because if you don't feel like yourself if you don't feel safe at work if you don't feel respected at work you can't bring your whole self to work you can't focus on the tasks that you have at hand so these might be small things but these are very important in terms of uh, how how an organization you know becomes more progressive thanks amulya sumeda So I think this uh, what actually matters is the like ma'am had already mentioned the mentality. I think that is some sensitivity training towards this process is something that every organization will need to bring it up. While that is from the organization perspective, like say you can also come up with better infrastructure or um, sensitivity towards the peer person and everything. the other important thing as a whole that they lack is the skill set that to actually reach an organization and to get employment or to um find any to be actually be a part of the society rather than being discriminated that is some skill set development i think from an organization perspective also they can commence such activities like say training of those people and all of that so that is one of the main thing that they lack like right from the, from a young age i think they are being discriminated which is in turn affecting the skill set development for them and thereby today in a scenario when there is when they go even if they are even if the organization is um say acceptable to such a acceptable to the hiring policies i am the skill set 
again becomes an issue when they require certain amount of tra uh, training and they are not able to dive into the um, job uh, immediately and the next point that we could uh, i mean organizations could consider is the uh, an active hr um, policy on recruiting and equal recruitment policy so that will be one of the they, like say we can as a as an organization the individuals can be okay with it but so long as the only if the hr takes up these actions and actually implement it only then will the effect be shown in the well they are like the thought will be converted into an action from the organization perspective uh, so, uh, so thankful for that actually this reminds me this discussion reminds me recently one of the organization one of our client organization approached us because they want to uh, come up with some initiatives for their diversity and inclusion and while in discussion the most one of the very strong points that the diversity and inclusion manager was speaking about was having lgbtq as their initiative for the year but what pushback she was getting from the management team was that uh, we clearly see productivity if we concentrate on gender discrimination okay there are a lot of numbers which prove that hiring women gets more productivity they are more efficient but we don't have any numbers which shows that hiring people from lgbtq would give uh, plus would give us more productivity okay so these questions really uh, pinch because unfortunately there is not a not lot of data and especially not a lot of data in indian context which is available there but my basic question is do we need data to give back to the society to start a motion because as an organization you are invested in csr right you you do a lot of work for the society can we take it as an initiative and if i have now you know uh, uh, people based out of various corporates i just wanted to seed that thought in your mind that not everything has to uh, circle back to a number can we look at it from a perspective that we want to do something different and be one of one of its kind right so uh, any ideas any thoughts about it um, any of you uh, vaishali amulya sumita what do you think about these initiatives have you worked with any organizations which does these things differently any any thought about it what happens in other than india okay so whatever uh, limited experience that i have in dealing with this subject uh, what i have seen uh, is people are still struggling to get their hands around how do you really address diversity in an equal manner i mean even diversity otherwise becomes you know polarized because then there are so much so many special efforts put into getting this diversity and inclusion in mainstream that that also can become a little lopsided so i think to have that balance uh to achieve the balance between i think amulya very rightly said about uh, having positive discrimination to include them in mainstream uh, workforce sumeda so also made a very important point of do they really have the skills even if you hire them do we do you really have the skills to absorb them in in mainstream workforce so this has to be a very graded approach right from who do you want to hire in what what level do you want to hire uh, or what are the functions and where do you look at for these hiring uh, do you want to tie up with ngos who work specially for transgenders uh, that is also something that organizations need to uh, to and not just wait and say oh we wait for a, for the third gender to apply through a normal recruitment cycle and then we will look at or do they want to take proactive measures for hiring is something that organizations can ask themselves um the the size of the organization will also matter uh, uh the function the function of the organization will also matter perhaps uh, uh the organizations who are into say uh consumer goods or are public facing 
maybe it's easier for them because soft giving them soft skills is could be an easier a uh, way of dealing with the situation up front uh, rather than waiting for them to become completely skilled because we cannot uh, overlook this the this uh, circumstance or situation that they have been uh, denied basic educational facilities also so waiting for qualified transgenders to apply for a position which requires a high skill uh, levels and high educational qualifications is just you know procrastinating so that you don't have to hire because you're not going to get transgenders at that level so i think this will have to be a boardroom discussion it this will have to be case to case basis as to what sort of an organization that i am working in what kind of people i need to hire at at what level where do i go and look for them proactively and not wait for them to to apply and then do i have my do, do i have my documentation and policies in place so that even after i hire them they feel safe in a workplace environment uh, when we when we talk about you know women issues we always talk about uh, safe circles that she should be able to to speak about her grievances in a safe circle without being uh, judged without being judged or without being labeled or with, there should not be any victim blaming i think when organizations are devising policies it's also important to establish that safe circle in the organization uh, which could be uh, uh, where uh, they could rope in counselors who have worked in 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 a certain space so that uh, the approach is not just paper based no you can't just say oh, i will this so and so has given us a lovely policy we loved it that's it you know it's well bound and kept somewhere or it's on some internal uh, portal and then nobody goes and looks at it because then the compliance will be there but the spirit of compliance is not there so so beautifully said the compliance is there but the spirit of compliance is not there so taking that uh, vishali taking that for, uh, further there is one question that is there on the chat box which is asking is there any law anything that is mandatory for organizations to do because of this law so can we list that down for the audiences that corporate should be doing okay so uh, if i if you go and the, this this act is not very big so i think all of you can just maybe later on download it's six pages so not really lot of homework for all of you to do so the law says that uh, it is a requirement of educational institutions uh, public sector organization government organizations uh, including private establishments to ensure that tr- there is no discrimination against transgenders so now there is a dictate which says that if you hire a transgender then you will not discriminate against so there is no of course no compulsion of hiring transgenders and that will not be that also will not be there that will have to be a voluntary exercise but the moment you hire them the way women get protected from sexual harassment at workplace by specialized legislation here the law is saying establishment should ensure that they are not subjected to any form of discrimination now what are the forms of discrimination which have been defined under that legislation it says that a discrimination such as termination discrimination such as health facilities or normal day to day facilities not being available to them i think we had an offline discussion about you know washroom facilities being made available to transgenders then that this a certain sensitivity has to be exhibited by organizations to ensure that such discrimination is not there discrimination against not allowing them to participate in certain activities that discrimination should not be there it however does not specifically talk about sexual harassment it does not unfortunately does not say that they also should should be protected against all forms of sexual harassment so uh, what i'll do is i'll just try and read two three words so that again we that we don't miss out on the essence denial or discontinuation of or unfair treatment in educational establishments or unfair treatment to transgenders 
uh, in relation with any employment or occupation. So a very large definition, it talks of unfair treatment or discriminatory treatment. I think we should be able to interpret this to include sexual harassment also. Uh, however, the way the POSH Act says that if you do not comply, 50,000 rupees fine or cancellation of license, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't say that. So I think that is something that has to be, because as I said, you know, it's, it's a universal law. We are well behaved when we are watched. So here there is no watch given. It's just a direction, you know, it, it's directory, you know, behave properly. But it doesn't say if you don't behave properly, what will happen? In fact, we also know under posh law, compliance was so dismal till companies that got amended to say listed companies have to publish in their annual report whether they have a committee or not. Till then, nobody was doing. When Vishaka guidelines were guidelines, we all were a part of several committees and nothing happened. I just used to get a renewal letter from state government, central government that your, uh, your appointment as committee member is renewed, nothing else. So I think that is what is missing in that law. So a stick is missing. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, there is one another question. I'm sorry, because we are talking about this uh, uh, regarding, uh, uh, you know, the penalties. Uh, is this a cognizable act is one of the question. And is there any provision of vicarious liability upon the employers in the act? That's these are two questions I thought was related. So I just quickly bounced it off to it. Do you want me to answer or? Yes, please, anybody, anybody. Uh... Okay, so um, uh, not cognizable, unfortunately, the, uh, the criminal offense which has been stated in this legislation is two years of imprisonment. So if you look at this read with CRPC, any offense which is three years of imprisonment or more becomes cognizable. So we always say under criminal law, three years is a golden number. So this is two years. So a non-cognizable offense. Again, as I said, unfortunately. But now we have uh, some decision which helps us uh, bring uh, sexual harassment of transgenders under main sections of IPC which are cognizable. So if I have to read Transgenders Act along with IPC, then it will become cognizable. And I think all of us, especially those who are in practice or even you know advisory consultation, should always look at interpretation of a legislation which is progressive, inclusive, and uh, sticks to the spirit of the legislation. So if I is so for example, if I do get a case of a transgender sexual harassment, I would like to invoke sections which which uh, which will be read with IPC, not just the transgender legislation. So uh, uh, reading both the acts together will really help us and be on the right side of the law. Also, the spirit of the act will be maintained. Is uh, what you're trying to say, right? So uh, moving to the uh, uh, to Sumedha, uh, Sumedha, what do you think? Um, if you have any tips, I think you mentioned that. But uh, if there is any other tips that you would uh, think that uh, corporate India should be given about including transgenders in workplaces, right? Uh, I, I heard Vaishali speaking about. Um, uh, training, uh, 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 you know, uh, go, going uh, proactively looking for people to be added to the group or to the organization. Okay, is there anything more you think uh, organizations can do to make transgenders more inclusive within the corporate structure? Um, I like I mentioned the sensitivity towards like from the top level to every staff. I think that is some training that can be given. Actually, it should be given to the other employees. And the, I mean, uh, it is a separate uh, set of training that needs to be given to the employees. The other benefit, uh, maybe we can, um, um, organizations can look at more like health and medical related benefits that can be provide, offered to them. Like most of these people, I think do not, while they might not like, they lack the skill set, they also lack the basic medical facilities and access to such facilities, which are very um, like very uh, remote and very um, 
like again there is discrimination when they go to access any of these medical facilities etc so that is one thing that can that organizations can bring in an effective policy towards offering them better benefits health insurance schemes etc and then uh, the next one is um, i think like uh, like uh, Uh, of late all the companies now have a uh, stringent policy towards and a mechanism towards handling um, posh related complaints i think that is something that they can definitely bring in for the uh, transgender community as well once they hire they need a specific process so while when there is a specific process laid down i think they also feel a little more comfortable to actually approach the topic and like seek um, measures to improve themselves one two and it also acts as a deterrent towards um, any harassment of any or discrimination of any sort against them and the third would be the infrastructure benefits that they can have they can have separate changing rooms like separate restrooms and these are basic uh, requ- basic uh, changes that in uh, an, as an organization they can easily bring about while the hiring active hiring training and all requires a lot more efforts into it i think these are these are these are simple infrastructural changes that every organization can easily bring about and it can be enforced um, more effectively yeah thank you sumita i think you gave in a lot of inputs for anybody who's there listening as a corporate that they can quickly implement amulya do you have anything to add on to what So Meta just mentioned. Uh, I think Meta has been quite comprehensive, but I would like to say, and also the hark back to a point that you made earlier now about how do we need numbers to tell us that we should be doing the right thing and being accepting of all you know all types, all genders of people across the spectrum. Uh, so thought just came to me then that you know uh, I mean we live in a capitalist world and uh, after all the final responsibility of a company of a corporation is towards its shareholder and it's only both I mean at the end of the day it only has to show the balance sheet the profits and all that. But uh, having said that, every organization you can also say has its own values and uh, within an organization there is a culture and uh, this is something that you can. very like you you can identify from the maybe from the top down or maybe even on the office floor the way the people talk to each other the way that people uh give space respect each other and all of that so uh even you when you think about that i mean there are there are many companies that have uh, shown a certain kind of uh, shown an affinity for certain kind of values so if you see when the uh, judgment repealing the uh, 37 section 377 came out there were several companies that celebrated this that said you know love is love this this is the kind of pride that we want and like if you remember uber had changed its uh, its user interface to change the route maps to the rainbow flag and small things like this there was a vix ad that brought in a trans woman gauri savant who had raised a child on her own uh, so at the end of the day these are values that Uh, an organization can finally choose to espouse and enforce and you know this will it will trickle down or it will also be reflected in the way that employees are treated and celebrated there was one company uh, i think thoughtworks uh, i i was reading a report uh, where you know the the trans employees are not just accepted they are celebrated and that is something that you know we should look at having we should we should be, we should be able to celebrate the differences and uh, make them feel special in fact because they are we are all very beautifully said uh, amulya yes thought works is one of the organization which we partner with also at kelpichar and uh, i'm very proud of that association because it makes me feel so warm whenever i go to that office uh, it, so i have heard uh, uh, employees saying that i feel safe within the organization rather being on the road i get discriminated i get bullied but within the organization i feel safe so people want to join such organization right uh thank you very much for that i just want one point uh, as we are speaking on these lines uh, to be discussing is about biases right biases that deter organizations from hiring uh, people from transgender or lgbt plus group right uh, is there any idea from the three of you uh, that we can help 
eradicate those bias or at least make people aware about those biases i know it's a little soft question for lawyers uh, because it's <laughs> uh, any thought any ideas from your side we should adopt what thoughtworks has actually adopted more organizations like that need to come up and start recruiting on an active basis and like so that more from the community and the discrimination uh, difference or like the uh, amount of discrimination comes down drastically yeah thank you very much sumida for that uh so i will be starting there is loads of questions pouring in and please i think we should start responding because we just have 9 minutes to go so i'm going to do that uh i can see the last question sorry uh, last in first out what about the concept of decision of nominating a member of parliament or mla or mlc i, I don't know if you all got that question uh it can be assessed based on total number of such community member members in the society so uh, i think it, it, are they trying to say that there needs to be some reservation for appointment of a member from the transgender you know i also feel you know many a time uh, these uh, uh, these uh, uh, positions are uh, like for women only for men only you know so uh, how how does that work i think that is what uh, they are referring to i think all the time uh, we we've, we've always spoken about positive discrimination posh has been one of the legislations which 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 is directly on about positive discrimination though there has been a, a lot of discussions now that posh needs to be a gender neutral legislation and it's high time it, it becomes that uh and for companies now have policies which are gender neutral but we all know the difference between a gender neutral policy uh, and a policy relating to women under posh act that statutory powers which are available to the uh, committee then do not are not available to a inquiry committee or a disciplinary committee uh, under any other policy which is an internal policy uh but till we wait for the governments to intervene and i either uh, come out with rules under transgender laws for a reservation or positive discrimination no one stops a corporate from doing that because that is finally by contract and that is by policy and that is what how what your corporate posture is so you can go all out and do that and have say 10% seats are reserved for transgender or and that is why i think in my earlier a uh, point that i was trying to make uh, we also need to know where you want to hire them uh, because if you want to hire them as say design engineers or uh, or systems analysts you may not get them so it's a very good feeling that you have a policy that oh yes i will hire design engineers knowing that you are not going to get them so you have a policy and you don't have to follow it also so it's like a that shouldn't happen Right. and that is how i think corporates need to look at it till we don't get a positive discrimination legislation around it sure so um, perfect we should not look around for any uh, discrimination but look at positive discrimination celebrate it as a molia used the right word okay and uh, about nominating a, as a mla or mlc i think there was one case study where a trans uh, person identified herself as a trans woman and filed a women's only uh, for women's only seat uh, uh, and uh, but there was a point saying that going forward then she cannot move uh, from one gender to other gender I, correct me i'm i'm not a lawyer but i read about that uh, that particular case Yeah, these are going to be tricky issues these are going and not just from transgender say transgender male to a transgender female uh these issues will also come up with uh gender fluidity and i think we need to deal with them as and when it comes because if you are claiming a seat under a particular reserved category and then you change your identity which is not under that reserved category these questions will come up and i think what will will have to be considered at that time is what was your intent at that time was your intent to procure a seat and then go for a sex change operation so i think that those will be 
that those will be issues that we ha will have to be dealt with at that point of time. All right, thank you. Uh, there's one question from Bhargavi, uh, which says that what about uh, women employees who are okay with transgenders at workplace, but are not comfortable sharing intimate spaces like washrooms with them? So I think uh, I can answer that question because it's a very HR question. Uh, I think um, you know, very important is to start creating awareness. Okay, have discussions on coffee table about these right so uh, earlier our days i remember even talking about sex was considered as a taboo how did it go away because we started discussing about it it was a family conversation so get that please start awareness building which is important i won't say the change will happen overnight but it has to be in the dna of the organization in believing strongly that they want to do uh, one more thing that can be done is build another washroom for transgenders. I think that that is completely that is an easy step. Like I had mentioned earlier, that is an easier, uh, better enforceable and easy enforceable solution to the, at least it is a start. Like we cannot expect a, um, what we want to achieve on day one. So I think that is an easier mechanism where we can build separate infrastructure for them, which will make them also much comfortable and the other members also much comfortable with this whole proposal. It, and more importantly, it shouldn't be shot down because of this reason where there is an easier solution to it. The greater goal is to develop a harmonious um, situation where everybody works hand in hand and there is no um, discrimination of any sort. Absolutely, beautifully said, Sumita. Uh, and you know what? Uh, recently, I visited one organization where men, women, everybody use same washrooms. Uh, I was shocked. <laughs> but I looked at it, you know, sometimes I feel when there is a change, take a step back and think that what are the pros and cons? You don't have to immediately react to it, right? So, so I'm still thinking about the pros and cons. I'm thinking, will a person be? I was a little taken aback because there was a man in the same wash where I was using it. And then I saw it was common for men and women. But I said, what the heck, right? It, it, let's, let's be open for change. So I think that mentality is important. And mindset, as I think uh, Vaishali started a conversation about. Yeah. Uh, another important question is, uh, one important aspect is identification as physical, biological, and orientation, which is mostly uh, physiological and psychological as tendency that creates differences. I think it's a statement. Thank you, Bhargav, for that. Can IC accept a sexual harassment complaint from a transgender? My favorite subject, yes. <laughs> I think they should. <laughs> I think uh, Vaishali also said that, that yes, they, we should. Uh, changes in all recruitment application forms are required very much. The other day I was reviewing um, a survey form where somebody had designed a survey form and when I dropped down on the gen uh, sex or gender this, it says male, female. So I had to go back and tell them that there's something really missing. You need to do something about it. Okay. And it should be also when somebody do not want to declare. You should give that option also. It's not only about third gender. It's also about giving an option that I do not want to declare my gender. Okay. Um, so what about compliant officer? Is it mandatory? Amulya is trying to answer that question. Oh, I, think I was just trying to say, I think they mean complaint officer as for the act. Yeah, I think the act specifies a compliance officer, right? Uh, to says a complaints officer so an officer that will uh, that will look a, a look at redressal of any complaints that a transgender will bring uh, and which is related to the organization and the discrimination that he has suffered in the organization so yes the law definitely talks of a complaints officer so complaints officer could be somebody like uh, for, from the grievance redressal com committee who can be they don't have to call it out that this is as per the law right um uh, no, they will have to call it out, though we all know, you know, that posh is definitely a very well worded law. It has its own challenges, no doubt, but uh, as compared to transgender law. So the way 
under posh you would have to display committee members names i think a proactive approach for organizations who really want to have a inclusive approach for transgenders and give them a confidence that you know okay we we have your back and here is a complaints officer and he, his name is displayed on the notice board so he, you know it's 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 an easily available information you you you're going to make them comfortable you're going to make them confident that yes i can move about freely over here and if i have a problem this is the person that i need to go to okay. so of course that person could be part of the ic committee but he i think he needs he or she needs to be or they need to be called out oh lovely that's that's a great input for a corporate uh, india uh, there's one question saying is bishaka guideline followed by supreme court i don't know <laughs> so uh, the supreme court in the case of vishakha who was a ngo said that there needs to be an internal redress and committee for to deal with cases of sexual harassment against women in a uh, uh, in any establishment or any company after that the supreme court had also said that within one year there needs to be a law and we all know it took about 18 years or 17 years for the law to come in and we eventually got in 2013 the posh law so now the guidelines are not followed because there is a full fledged law which looks which has the guidelines as its basic framework so vaishali i think i don't know if uh, uh, bhargav is asking that question is that uh, uh, related to the cgi chief justice of india who was accused of sexual harassment and uh, he appointed an ic committee where he was part of it so i don't know if it was a sarcastic question uh, so i'm just assuming that then i perhaps i missed the sarcasm i gave a very straight answer <laughs> yeah so I, i i don't know if it was i'm just guessing because there's no emotion here so <laughs> it's written there all right what reforms organization should make and that can promote inclusivity and diversity at workplace i think smita we answered that amulya talked about anti discriminatory policy please share other good practices so smita they have spoken about it so i think that's fine um i'd like to add one point to that uh, i think uh, uh, in the drafting of the policies a transgender person could be consulted because i think they are the best to speak about their experience uh, this is something that even uh, the objections to the statute itself has been uh, has 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 highlighted the fact that you know we don't have enough transgender representation in the parliament means that uh, all the all the iterations that the, the draft bill and all went through may still have missed out uh, what what may have really affected the transgender community because their voices are not being effectively represented in the parliament so similarly in an organization which wants to make sure their voices are heard and their concerns are addressed you could have you could you know run your policy draft by a transgender person who will you know willingly consult in terms of whether it effectively addresses uh, their concern awesome point i think ask ask a woman if they want to draft something for woman ask a man if you're drafting something for man ask that community right it's as simple as that thank you that's a brilliant point okay uh, another question is government only is the main agency to create awareness politicians and government officers are to be involved to apply and create it. and that's a statement thank you for that uh, as a corporate social responsibility companies organizations should now start working for transgender person i agree with you vidula for example creating awareness campaigns for society to accept them as they are uh, to train them on skills to create education and employment opportunities yes i think we should go to the level of uh, educating children who come from that background right because you know if you don't sow the seed now uh, our kids won't be able to reap the benefit later right so it is important that we go to that level create an ecosystem for them organizations can take charge of this and they spend a lot of money they have to spend a lot of money on corporate social responsibility and this could be one yes mudula brilliant point thank you so much now uh, it's important at the family unit level to be more accepting of children yes uh, there's a statement by shobhana would more awareness at education level help yes please bullying at schools starts okay it starts from there 
uh, absolutely agree with this point and we should be doing something on this. Uh, another question, I don't know if it's a question or a statement, let me read it. In spite of law recently passed in India, we are still to achieve progress. So it's a statement in Europe and America, Australia also, I think he meant penal, ident pre-anal identity includes gender, sex, sexual orientation. Yes, uh, it's physical, biological, and psych yes, physiological, and psychological. We are yet to... Sorry? Prenatal. Prenatal, okay. Thank you, Amulya, for correcting me. Yeah. Oh, wow. There is a comment here from Inakshi. She says, I'm very proud being F Fujitsu member. We are already following all the compliances with regard to Transgender Act. We have implemented the compliance into tasks, and those are mapped in our software tool created by Legacies. Thank you so much. And I'm really proud of you uh, to hear that. Keep it up. Uh, what does law mandate for organization? I think we spoke about that. Um, Santosh says, so true, Amulya, glad to hear your thoughts on how organizations can anti-discriminate and create a respectful environment. Okay, I think we have covered all the questions and we are at eight six. Any closing comments from each one of you is welcome. Um, Vaishali, I'll go last. <laughs> I think I just want to say thank you for uh, you know making me part of this panel. It was a wonderful, fantastic discussion that we had, and uh, I learned so much. So thank you, and uh, thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Amulya. I learned so much. Yeah, thank you. I think thank you, uh, Kelsechar and ILA for putting this together. I think this is something that uh, more people at the start should start talking about it. Once they start talking about it, it converts into action and we reach our end goal of having no discrimination towards this process. Absolutely. Start talking. With our... Absolutely. Make it a, a dinner table conversation. Yes. Thank you, Smita, Aile, and uh, as I said, Dr. Bearers of Kelpechar. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion. I enjoyed the being co-panelist with Amulya and Sumedha. I had a lot to learn, a lot to discuss. So many new things, new uh, narratives have come out of this discussion. And I'm sure the audience also must have picked up some points in order to, to change what their current positioning is about uh, dealing with transgender. I, I had a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, each one of you. It was a great learning. Uh, I'm very excited about this. Uh, uh, keep writing questions. If you have this question, we are together exploring this. It's a new thing for all of us. Okay, we have not brought up with these thought processes. Maybe it's time for us to change, look at it differently, take a step back, review it, right? And with that, I close this. Uh, thank you, Madhura. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Vaishali. Thank you, Amulya. Thank you, Sumedha. You're a great panel members and I enjoyed having this conversation. Thanks to you, thank Smita. You. As always, a lovely moderation from you. All our panelists, thank you for the rich conversation on this topic. So uh, we at ILA have started accepting any write-ups or uh, podcasts or any solo sessions, monologues on any topic related to the Posh Law. In case if anyone of you is interested, you could just reach out to us. Uh, I'll send a mail to you tomorrow regarding this. And we would be very happy to uh, gain more insights from all of you uh, on the topics related to this law. Thank you so much. Wish you a very good night. Thank you. Good night, John.